Thank you, choir. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to summer, suddenly. <laughs> uh, this morning, we're celebrating the seventh Sunday of Easter, Ascension Sunday. Uh, but we're also celebrating Mother's Day. So happy Mother's Day to all the mothers and grandmothers out there. Um, we have, we're going to have a gift for you when you depart today. So. Um, when I was thinking about this, grandmothers, I'm mother, grandmother, I'm both, but I bet there's some um, great-grandmothers in the audience today. Anybody? Oh, ah, wow. Oh, congratulations. What a, what a blessing it is to have an opportunity to know and to love and maybe influence three generations after you. That's, that's amazing. What a legacy. Anyway, as I get started, I want to welcome any guests who are with us today, invite you to join us for coffee and treats and conversation in the conference room, which is right across the way. I would ask you to turn your attention to the announcements, which are on the back of your program, uh, starting with our flowers today, beautiful, are provided by Bob Murray, in loving memory of his son Marshall, whom he, he was blessed to spend 54 wonderful years with. And today is also, coincidentally, Bob's 85th birthday, so happy birthday, Bob, wherever you are. I saw you earlier. So the next announcement was not in the bulletin, but I have confirmed it with Gloria, that on May 28th, which is a Tuesday this time, we'll be having the Women's Fellowship gathering at 2 o'clock in the conference room. Please bring some small finger food to enjoy and uh, get to know some of the other chapel ladies in a smaller, casual setting. Um, a final wonderful announcement is that Pastor Bill had his delayed gallbladder surgery last week. Um, he's recovering well at home, doing well, but keep those prayers coming for Bill and for Gloria, his caretaker. <laughs> we'll, wel welcome him having, having, we'll welcome him back as soon as possible. Um, and Cindy Drew, shout out, off the prayer list and back at on the up and Adam list. <laughs> Thank you. Prayers answered, and there she goes. Walk in proof. Um, so, first I want to talk to you, I want to introduce you to our guest speaker today, who's filling in for Bill, a good friend of Bill's. <laughs> so, uh, Reen was supposed to be the worship leader today, but she's traveling and visiting family for Mother's Day, and so asked me to switch dates. And then as soon as she asked me, I found out that I was going to get to be introducing my friend Pam. Um, so I was very excited to see yes. And I'm very blessed to know Pam. So a little bit about Pam. Pam and her late husband Tim uh, came to Evergreen Church. They were recruited there as pastors and leaders many years ago. If you don't know Evergreen Church, it's right outside the gates. It's now called the New Evergreen Church, right on Yerba Buena. You can't see the church from the road, but it's right there, um, just outside our gates. Pastor Bill is, came from Evergreen Church, came to us. They put him on loan. And he's also still an elder at Evergreen Church, very involved. He and Gloria are still very involved there. So we're almost sister churches, but not quite. <laughs> so when we first formed our small group Bible study, we were all village residents, but we were a hybrid of couples from Evergreen and couples from the villages and the chapel. So I had been to a lot of Evergreen events over the years um, and had heard Pam speak, had heard at Christmas, especially at Christmas ladies' luncheons, and had, had heard Tim speak. Um, and I know where, they're coming, where she's coming from, and you're going to love her wisdom today. But we officially met Tim and Pam in 2019. Our Bible study group had been dreaming of taking a trip to Israel, to the Holy Lands. And the people from Evergreen in our group said, well, Tim and Pam have led 
dozens of <laughs> trips to the Holy Lands. And we said, well, we'll get information from them. We got information, we got them. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was great. They were our leaders. And what a marvelous trip we had. Um, our Israeli tour guide nicknamed us the Fantastic 27. <laughs> I was going to wear the shirt today, but it's pretty ratty looking by now. <laughs> Most of the 27 of us were fellow villagers. Um, we were just so blessed to have Tim and Pam's expertise and familiar knowledge with the area, their biblically, biblical knowledge and their wisdom. Every single venue we visited, we would sit down, listen to Tim's teachings, pray about what happened, you know, how we were, process how we were feeling it and uh, review the Bible passages of the events specifically related to that very location. It was amazing. You talk about walking in the footsteps. It's humbling. We finished our tour of Israel with baptisms in the Jordan River even. So I had all the pictures out this week and it brought back all sorts of good memories. Um, but it, it struck me for the first time how lucky we were that we took that trip when we took that trip. Um, we were there in November, mid to late November of 2019. As soon as we got back, the world shut down for the pandemic shortly after that. So it would have shut, up, shut off opportunities for years to have done that trip. We spent time in the Golan Heights, which is mile, just miles, a few miles from both the borders of um, Lebanon and Syria. You couldn't do that now. <laughs> We spent time in the West Bank. I mean, Bethlehem is in the West Bank. You couldn't do that now. Um, none of this would have been possible in light of regional conflicts. So anyway, good, good memories, good times. Enough about my vacation. <laughs> so let's stand and, uh, join, and sing our first hymn, which is Happy Our Home When God Is There. And after that, you're going to stay standing for the silent prayer. Okay, join us in a moment of silent prayer. Thank you. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to commune with you and to offer up our individual concerns and prayer requests. Amen. Okay, now you're gonna be seated and enjoy the choir.
Let's pray. Almighty God, we ask your blessing on us today. And not just us, but those that we love. We also pray for every child, every mother, everyone that is celebrating today. I pray that this would be a day not of sorrow and regret, but that our hearts would be filled with laughter and joy. Surround them with love from family and friends. Grant them health, peace, fulfillment as they pursue your calling so that one day those mothers would be considered blessed and be called blessed. Let them know your value and your worth and how you see them from your eyes, not from the world's. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And now will you join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thou is patent, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. for the beauty of the earth. If you're able to stand, would you stand as we sing the doxology? offering prayer. Lord, we know that all good things come from you, and we thank you. And from these riches, we bring this offering and give it back to you. Help us to use it for the fulfillment of your purpose in this place and around the world, and for the benefit of those in needs. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Beautiful, both of you. Thank you so much. Um, I was, well, Bill had asked me to speak when he found out he was going to have surgery. And, I, you know, I started thinking about, of course, it's Mother's Day. So I thought, okay, I can speak on mothers. Of course, then half of the audience is asleep because they're men. <laughs> And so they don't have to listen. They automatically turn you off, right? And then I thought, okay, I could speak on the um, Proverbs 31 virtuous woman. Of course, then we all leave guilty because we're not that. We want to be that, but we're not that. And I thought, no, we can even be very successful, and they fail. The most successful mother fails. So I thought, no. And then I thought about, well, what did Jesus' followers want to know? What would benefit them? And I want to benefit the whole congregation. And I thought, okay, what did Jesus' followers want to know? They, they followed Jesus, and they walked with Jesus, and they saw him do all sorts of things. And so when they came to him and they asked him questions, you know, they had seen him teach, and they could have said, but they didn't, Lord, teach us to teach like you teach. That's not what they asked. They watched him heal and raise the dead. And they could have said, oh, Lord, teach us that one. That's really good. Teach us to heal. Teach us to raise the dead. And that's not what they asked either. They'd seen Jesus help people. They could have said, Jesus, teach us how to serve like you serve. But they didn't. They could have said, help us learn how to perform miracles. Teach us to perform miracles. No. Nope. Teach us to turn bread and, in, and a little loaf of bread and a little bag, boy's bag lunch into feeding 5,000. But they didn't ask him to teach them how to do that. How do you, Lord, how did you turn water to wine? Teach us how to do that. Wouldn't that be fun at a party? <laughs> Save you a lot of money. Um, but that's not what they asked. You remember what they asked? Teach us to pray. I think this is beneficial to all of us because there's one thing I know, I can't heal. I can't raise the dead, but I can pray. And so it doesn't really matter this morning what your role is or uh, your title or how long you've walked with the Lord or if you're just a toddler with the Lord. We can all learn from this lesson. So we're going to look, you've already prayed it once today, but we're going to look at Matthew 6, and it's, the, there's, it's actually twice in the Bible, Matthew 6 or uh, Luke 11, but it's often called the Lord's Prayer. I want us to change that this morning because it's really our prayer. 
It's the prayer that Jesus taught his followers to pray. If you really want to know the Lord's Prayer, that's over in the garden when, you know, in John chapter 17, when he starts praying his words, and it's about us. But let's look at this, and really it's a pattern, a template for us of how to pray. So at first, we start off with our Father in heaven, our Father who art in heaven. Just stop and think about that. How amazing is it that you have a heavenly father who is not up there pacing back and forth, what am I going to do with this world? No, he is seated on a throne. We have a father seated on the throne in heaven. Prayer begins with this relationship right, right off the bat. He's letting us know we're the child, he's the father. He is our father. The minute you ask Jesus to rule and reign in your heart, you, the Bible says we have been adopted in. And so we have this father. He is our father. And this would have astounded the disciples because they didn't pray this way. They weren't even, remember, I mean, you didn't even say the name of God it was too holy, so they felt very distant from him. But here Jesus is saying, no, you have a father in heaven. We have a father in heaven. That means there is no situation, no location that I am ever in that I will ever be alone. None. Because I have a father who's living who's seated on the throne. Second, hallowed be your name. We've already talked about he's our father. So here we've got a prayer that it's setting apart his character. So it's reminding us, what is the actual nature? What, is, what do we know about God? What is his actual character? We want to holy his name. We want to surrender under his name. So what do I know about this God? Well, I know he's king of kings. I know he's lord of lords. I know that there's no one more majestic than his name. I know that he is a sustainer. I know that he's a helper. I know he's faithful. And not just faithful today, he will be faithful to the very end. I know that he's a comfort. I know that he's a peace. I know he's the lover of my soul. I know he's a good shepherd. What do you know about your God? The bigger he gets to you, the more you know about him. Oh, you want to hallow yourself under the name and the mighty name of God. He has all power. So think about it. When I go to the Lord in prayer, I've already just said two things. I've said, he's my father. We have this relationship. And basically, as I hallow his name, I'm basically saying, there is nothing too big for you, God. Nothing. You have all power. You have all authority. You, you are able to do far more than what I could ask or think or imagine. That is amazing. You know, a lot of times we want to worry and fret and, you know, before we even go to the Lord in prayer, think how much better it is when we go and use this template. Before we even cry out to the Lord, we start thinking about his power, his name, who he is, what he says he will do, before we've even asked for things. Because sometimes I have this whole shopping list of things that I think God should do or not do or go get them and, you know, whatever. And I go through these two steps and I, half of them are already gone away. God, you already know what you're going to do in that situation. You're in control. Nothing surprises you. I remember when my husband was diagnosed, it's been one year ago, he was diagnosed with glioblastoma, which is a brain tumor, 
in, op in, in my husband's case, Tim, um, it was inoperable. Uh, it was, you know, when the doctor says you have a very large brain tumor, that's not the words you want to hear. You want to hear it's a pea size or something, but that's not the diagnosis we got. And I remember going home, and at the time, my mother-in-law was living with us, and she's 94, and I could tell, you know, she was worried. You can imagine you're getting this shocking news. And I remember standing in my kitchen, and I said, we know our God. We will trust and believe our God. I said, we will not dishonor his name. Because how can I say he's all powerful? Oh, but not with brain tumor. How could I say that, oh, he's in control? Oh, well, not of this situation. No. No matter what happens, I know my God. I know who he is. I've seen it time and time and time again. He's faithful. Then, the next um, phrase, your kingdom come. Oh, that is hope, isn't it? Oh my gosh. Yes, that is hope. And really what we're doing when we're praying that, we are asking to bring your will and bear it on my will. You know, God doesn't give us grace for my kingdom to work. <laughs> but really, I get grace to be a part of his kingdom. Remember the disciples? They had a really hard time and had lots of confusion about the kingdom. Um, if you read Mark 9, remember they were more concerned about who's going to be first and who's going to get to sit on the right and the left of Jesus. And, and, you know, Jesus had to say, hey, 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 wait a minute. The Son of Man is going to be delivered in the hands and he's going to be killed. And then after three days, he's going to rise. And they argued, like, amongst themselves, who's going to be first and who's going to be greatest. And Jesus had to tell them, it's not about that. It's about humbling yourself and becoming a little child. You know, it's interesting. That's exactly what sin does in our lives. It causes all of us to be little self-sovereign gods. Little, really little. It causes us to appoint ourselves as many kings or queens over our kingdom. And we forget that we're part of his kingdom. And it's really not about our kingdom at all. You know, through our story of Tim's illness and then his passing, I often said, God is writing a story to all. God writes the story because everything's about God. We are created for him. Okay, so everything's about God. He is the author of this story. We have this little tiny part in the story. Sometimes we get that reversed. We think the story is all about us. <laughs> Don't we? Yes. We start thinking the world's revolving and spinning around us. Everything's got to go our way and got to go perfect in our lives and got to look so good and just everything's got to work out just so perfect. And the story's not about us. It's about our God. Real life is found only when his kingdom come and his will is done. And that's exactly what grace offers for us and welcomes us. The next phrase, your will be done, is a hard one, really, to pray. We can all pray. I mean, we all prayed it this morning, didn't we? We all said those words. They're easy to say. That's a harder thing to live. You know, there's a, in the 1950s, I don't really remember it, um, a show called Father Knows Best. 
Remember, no matter what the problem was, no matter what situation the family got into, Father always knew best, and he always found a way out. And in 30 minutes, it was all tied up in a neat little bow. Don't you wish that's the way life really was? Well, we do have a Father that knows best. You know, it's interesting because as you think about it, he has such a different vantage point than we do. He sees everything. He knows everything. And not just the here and now, he knows all the past, and he also knows all the future of how this is going to work out. I mean, just think about it. How many times in your life that you were like, oh, I don't see how this is going to work out? And then it does. But you didn't know it at the time. You were walking in faith that it would work out or that it would just happen. Well, I know that it's not easy to surrender. I knew when Tim got the diagnosis, I knew our God could heal. I wasn't sure that he would heal. I knew he could. I also knew it would be a miracle. We had already been told that. Our doctor said, you have two months. Not what you want to hear either, is it? So what we did as a family, I have a son and a daughter, and they're both married, and then one grandchild who is, I wish your grandchildren were as precious as mine is. <laughs> um, she's adorable, but so what we did was we all came together as a family. We went away for a whole solid week before treatment started, before we did anything, and had some deep conversations, good conversations. What do we want this to look like? How are we going to live like this as a family? My daughter-in-law is a um, heart surgeon, so you know she's had to have these kind of conversations with a lot of patients and a lot of families. So she kind of guided, it, guided us along. My husband was still able to make decisions and talk and, you know, was part of the thinking process and stuff. But we got to say a lot of things that we all wanted to say. We wanted to make sure we were all on the same page as the family. Um, we were giving Tim the option, okay, do you want to do treatment? They've already told us it might prolong, it's not going to cure. So we knew the option. And so he said, yes, I will try. We'll see how it goes. But as long as I can handle the radiation and the chemo, um, I'll go forward. And then we prayed as a family. Your will be done. I was just talking to my daughter this last weekend. She was up from L.A., and she's, somebody asked her, how did you guys get through that? And she said, it was God's will, not my will. And she said, I specifically prayed that because I didn't want to be angry at God if he didn't answer my prayer. She goes, I could accept it that way. If I was praying for just healing because I want my dad to be here longer, and God didn't answer, then I might be mad because I didn't get my will. But she said, I kept remembering, no, God's will, God's will, God's will be done. Much easier to say than to really believe. Next, we see that give us this day our daily bread. Oh, I am dependent on God. Every day, I need him. Not just, not just bread. I mean, I think they, the disciples would have known this. Remember the children, in, in, as they wandered in the desert, they got manna every day. They needed fresh manna every day. They couldn't rely on yesterday's manna. They needed fresh manna every day. They were able to see God provide every moment, every day. As we ask God to provide for us every moment, every day, it is a connection to him as our provider. 
you know, I don't know about you, but it's really easy to forget about that when things are going good, when finances are rising, when all of our needs are being met, when we have everything seemingly in our own power. But we need to remember that I am utterly dependent on him. Only he has the power to control events and people and situations and conditions. Boy, did I ever learn that last year. It seemed like every day I had a new or a different need. You know, when you first start going through an illness like this that was so devastating, you know, people are going, how can I help? How can I help? What can I do? What can I do? Well, I didn't need a 9 by 13 casserole. I'm sorry, I did not need that right then. You know, I mean, I know everybody wants to help you out and everybody wants to be there for you. And, you know, but at first you don't even know what you need. You're so confused. You're kind of in a whirlwind of trying to figure out even what's this going to look like? What does this mean in our daily lives? So it seemed like every day was something new and different. Can I tell you, I have lacked nothing. God provided over and over and over again. At just the right moment, a beautiful flower arrangement would arrive at my door. Now, how did that get there the very day that I had the worst night I had the night before and the worst morning I had had, and yet here comes this flower arrangement from not even a friend, but a friend of a friend that heard about our story. That was God. I mean, maybe it had her name on the card, but I knew where that came from. It was God. When a card would arrive just when I needed it in the nick of time. Money, laundry, car washes. Oh, you guys don't mow yards. We still mow our yard. <laughs> you, know, you know, a guy coming over to mow and blow. And they wouldn't even knock on my door. They would just be there, done, gone. I loved it because they didn't care about the fame and glory of it. They were just there to serve. It was lovely. So, so good. Nothing was lacking. He controls all situations. Our needs are completely being met by him. Then the prayer goes on to say, forgive us as we also have been forgiven. Every day we need forgiveness. And we need to forgive others every day. We need this reminder every day in this prayer that I've been forgiven of a great debt, the debt of sin, sin that I could not pay for, that I could do nothing about, and yet God has forgiven me. It helps me forgive others when I think of it that way. Lead us not into temptation. Every day we need victory, victory over temptation. You know, Jesus is really saying here, Father, may your name be honored and adored. May your will be done. May you, our needs be met. May our sins be forgiven. And may we have victory over temptation. Virtually everything we pray fits into these categories. And then notice it's not just me, my, or mine. It's our and us. We pray this corporately for everyone. We want the good of everyone. Deliver us from evil. I don't know about you, but that means deliver me from me. Because where's the evil? It's not on the outside of me, it's on the inside of me. You're probably sitting there and we're listening to her speak on the Bible today and she's talking about evil in her own heart. I guarantee you, you go to any playground and you watch two little boys start shoving and pushing and hitting and you break them up and you're like, what are you doing? He will never say, oh, please pray for me. I have an evil heart. <laughs> Am I right? No, 
He's going to say that kid, and of course, it's going to be blaming others. Now, we laugh about it, but we do the exact same thing. We work really hard to convince ourselves the problem's not us, it's everybody else. Because you don't know who I live with, or you don't know how busy I am, or I was in a hurry, or you don't know, I was tired that day. That's why I said it snarky. I must have misunderstood. Instead of saying, oh me. By grace, we are able to pray, deliver us from evil, as we are admitting that the evil is within. And that really is our greatest danger. Praise God, he offers grace. Grace to you and I, so that we can even offer grace to others. Jesus and his followers knew what they needed most. Not miracles, not healing. They needed prayer. So Jesus gave us our prayer as a gift. Would you close your eyes with me right now? Father, we thank you for this prayer. Lord, we thank you. What a good God you are. We thank you, O oh God, that we can use this template every day to pray for us and others. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Please stay and join us for refreshments. Thank <laughs> you.